welcome to Latter-day Profiles. I'm Brian Howard. We're here at the LDS Motion Picture Studio in Provo, Utah. And joining me today is Dr. Lily Anderson. Thank you for joining us today. So good to have you. A licensed clinical social worker, author, uh, Choosing Glory uh, is both the book and the podcast you can catch. Uh, PhD in marriage and family and human development. Lily and her late husband, Chris, are the parents of eight and grandparents of 37, 36 living grandkids. So good to have you. I'm so glad you're here. I've heard you. I think the first time I, I listened to you was on the, the uh, Come Fall In podcast with John Bodyway and Hank Smith. And I loved it. It was just uh, straightforward, honest, true, and in, in, in a loving way. So I really appreciate it. So every time Thank you're you. on, then I look forward to that. Plus, it turned me into your podcast as well, which I really enjoyed listening to. I want to find out about your background. Your bio talks about a background, your mom from uh, French, from France, I suppose, and father mm -hmm. Mexican. What was life like growing up for you with those confluence of backgrounds? I didn't know any different. <laughs> you know? Until I got a little older and my friends pointed out that my parents had accents. <laughs> Which, you know, you don't really pick up when it's what you hear all the time. Um, they were fascinating people, and I attribute a lot of the good things in my life to that beginning. Um, they came from nothing, really. I mean, both of them ended up, they met at BYU, the melting pot of the Mormon world, and um, had come basically with nothing but widowed mothers mm. and worked their way through. My dad did three college degrees in his second language. My mom did three college degrees in her third language. Wow. And nobody helped them in the ways that sometimes we get help now, other than the, our Heavenly Father, who was generous and magnified their efforts. Um, I'm in the middle of three girls, and we had fascinating dinner table discussions. They were sociologists, and so they talked all the time about the things that they were learning and observing and how to apply it in life. They were faithful members of the church. Neither of them had had the benefit of being close to organized church uh, groups growing up for a very long, long time, but they both were faithful throughout their lives, you know, read the Book of Mormon, that's basically all they had until they got closer to organized church groups and, and then just kept learning. So anyway, it, it was fabulous. We were in the Midwest, so there weren't very many members of the church. So not only did I have, you know, foreign parents, but I was a member of the church. So, you know, my teachers would ask me if my dad had more than one wife and things <laughs> like that. So, you know, all of that was also unusual for people. So I don't know which was most unusual in a way. But, um, you know, they were, they were scholars, true scholars, in uh, meaning that they really always were seekers of truth. And they accepted as truth the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that informed all of their research. Mm -hmm. They knew God didn't make mistakes, but then they went about discovering why what he said is true and how to demonstrate that in practical ways. So really, it was a terrific way to grow up. Mm -hmm. I am very grateful for my heritage. What was you know church life like for you? Activities, meetings, and such while you were growing up in the Midwest. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, the whole state of Indiana was one state, <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was on the high council for quite a while. So we would travel oh, wow. all through the state, you know, on those Sundays. To, so we got to see all the different wards and branches in the various parts of the state. There were only two wards in Indiana, Indianapolis, when we moved there, and then four when we left. Um, twelve years later, was it twelve years later? And um, now there's a temple in Indianapolis, which is incredible and phenomenal. So I was the only member of the church in my school, for instance. But so church was really important. You know, we were 30 minutes away from the, the building. And back then we went to church twice on Sundays. Right. So we spent, you know, two hours on the road every Sunday just to get to and from our meetings. And we went during the week for primary. And, you know, they had, you know, the fundraiser bazaars, the Relief Society yeah, things. Right. You know, we celebrated Pioneer Day, uh, you know, things like that, with a little parade in the parking lot. The ward was close. And, and I have found that as we've lived different places. Uh, since my marriage, um, we found that the further away you are from the pioneer quarter, so to speak, the more the ward becomes your family. Mm -hmm. You know, you come in the first Sunday and your family because mm -hmm. you're needed and, and welcomed in that way. And sometimes we lose a little of that in the West. Yeah. And so what was it like? Yeah, you came out, your, your parents came to BYU. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that? That was probably a dramatic change for you. It was. Um, they also got an offer from BYU Hawaii, and my sisters oh. and I were pretty upset. <laughs> <laughs> they chose Provo. <laughs> but I had a, one of my Mexican uncles was here, and, and faculty too, So um, and he started the ballroom dance team at BYU. Oh. So the two brothers were there, and three actually professors then eventually with the last name De Hoyos, which is not a common name. But um, 
yeah, it was it was great. I started high school when they moved here, so it was a big change. And you know what? Frankly, it was the hardest year of my life because mm. kids can be slow to open up in these yeah. areas. Yeah. And then I had terrific uh, a terrific three year stint in high school after that. Mm. And that's why you you met your husband, as I think. I you, did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was one year ahead of me, but why? <laughs> get, get, get you in line. Uh, you were going to school. Was there any other choice than sociology for you to, to <laughs> choose for a degree? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually a really good student. So I got national awards, and people were talking about back in those days where feminism was young, and I, you know, has done so much damage. Let me just go on record saying that right off. But I am... Um, but there was a push to use my academic talents in lots of other ways. You know, you should be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon or, you know, things like that. And I considered a lot of those things because um, I was a really good student and I'm great at you know, taking standardized tests. But. <laughs> so I, I had options and my parents were supportive of anything. But I, I was interested in, in all that I had grown up listening to. And, um, and then... Thinking back, I, I remember thinking about this not long ago and remembering that we didn't worry too much about graduating back then. If we got married and wanted to have a family, and I had become strongly converted to motherhood in my high school journey, hmm. um, honestly because of my husband. He had asked me how I would handle a career and children if I wanted both. And he was very kind and respectful. He wasn't challenging or whatever. He was just wondering how I would do that. I had a French grandmother growing up. So I never had a babysitter, a sitter, never had to go anywhere to be taken care of. And it finally occurred to me that you don't get a French grandmother standard issue when you marry. So I thought, what would I do? And I really didn't like the idea of daycare or, mm. or babysitters. And so I, pray, I started praying about it. And in General Conference, they were talking a lot about the Equal Rights Amendment back then yeah. and the importance of mother's roles. And as I listened and prayed about those things, I got this powerful testimony of full-time motherhood. And it changed my life. Even if I hadn't married my husband, I would have been grateful to him forever for posing that question in a very kind, respectful way and letting me come to that place where I realized that if I had the opportunity, I, I couldn't use whatever talents I had in any better way than being a full-time mom. So I wasn't worried about graduating. And in fact, we got married. Just before I started my last year of school, I got pregnant right away. We had a honeymoon baby. So I had these two semesters. And I almost, I mean, I wasn't worried about graduating. Somehow I noticed on my transcript that I had a lot of credits. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, hey, I could probably apply for graduation. <laughs> and so I did. And I graduated. But I wasn't even concerned with it. And one of the reasons I chose sociology was because it didn't require a minor. And I could take lots of fun electives <laughs> to fill in the requirements. <laughs> So it was almost happenstance. I didn't expect ever to go back to school. I didn't expect to have any kind of career path because of that really powerful message that I'd gotten about mothering mm. and was able to be a full-time mom for 18 years. Best thing I ever did. Mm. I think I, I learned more in the trenches than mm. any, any other setting in my entire life. Yeah, you were able to stay at home with your family for all that time. Mm -hmm. uh, at what point did it say, okay, I want to do more education. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that point never came, I'll be honest with you. I, uh, I had been asked to teach um, seminary, uh -huh. loved that, loved that. And I'm embarrassed to say that I knew I would love teaching the gospel every day, but I didn't realize how much I would love the kids. Oh. <laughs> and then that was quickly brought home to me, how much I loved those young people. And to be able to share the gospel with them daily was amazing. This was early morning seminary in Las mm. Vegas. So um, I was, and I had taught gospel doctrine in so many different wards. And then, then one stake asked me to teach an adult religion class. I still wasn't thinking any career path. These were just surprising, wonderful opportunities. Mm. My husband was the agency director for LDS Family Services in Las Vegas and actually all of Nevada. He mm. had a lot of invitations. He started bringing me along. I didn't have any particular credentials, but I started getting my own invitations. So I, I was very happy with what and all my children were about to be in school. My youngest was going to start first grade soon. It just seemed like I would go seamlessly into that next stage. I was praying about something completely unrelated when the only way I could describe this is baseball bat revelation. I was not even really asking about that, but I got hit on the head with um, a very powerful message was really a whole sentence in my head that said, until you go back to school and get an MSW, I don't want you to succeed at anything else. Mm. And I was in the car at the time. I did a lot of praying in the car, just as busy as I was. Mm. 
I had to pull over because I was so shaken by that message. It was just before we all had cell phones. I, I went home, I called my husband, and I said, this is what just happened. And he said, well, that's fascinating because UNLV just started a school, a graduate school of social work mm. a year or so ago, and um, that would be available here. I certainly wasn't going to leave my family to pursue education or anything. I didn't want to go, cried for a whole weekend. My husband said, then don't go. I said, no, I'd have to turn my table recommend. <laughs> <laughs> this was so clear. So um, miracles happened. I never, I got paid to go to school, and that was kind of unheard of back then. At any rate, and my husband, amazing man, um, facilitated everything. He immediately started doing the cooking and the laundry and the shopping and, I mean, just took over a lot of things that I had done for years and facilitated everything. Um, miracles, again, I, I was not thrilled to go back, but I am thrilled that the Lord speaks to me. And he knows so much better than I do. I've had opportunities I would never have dreamed of. I, I mean, it has been an incredible path of um, blessings, certainly sacrifice, not just my own, but my family's, but mm. it's been a great path. Well, you started at some point your own practice. Was that, uh, how did that come about? So when my husband started taking me to speak in different places, they were actually getting calls to the family service office in Las Vegas asking if people could come in and see me. Mm. And they had to tell them, <laughs> she's not a counselor. <laughs> she was, sorry. Um, so I had a practice that was waiting for me. And as soon as I was far enough in the program where I could see clients in a supervised setting, I had clients waiting to see me. So that has never been a problem. I, I mean, it, it's, it's been a remarkable mm. kind of journey. A lot of therapists have told me they've never even heard of anything mm -hmm. that was so seamless in a way. And even coming to Utah, when my husband got transferred up here, I thought I would lose all my clientele and, you know, I would, I was fine with that. I was going to take up, you know, catch up on some other things. And then I, that baseball bat hit again and told me I needed to start a PhD program, yeah. which I did two weeks after we moved. I still didn't think I'd see very many clients and especially being in that program, but a lot of people in Las Vegas know people in Utah. <laughs> so I got calls immediately and we had to change the design of our home to include a separate entrance for a basement office where I could see clients. So that became um, another step and overlapped with the teaching that followed my graduate program. Yeah, you know, what I'm thinking about is, you know, you counsel with people, uh, man, it's great, easy to be a backseat, you know, <laughs> but face to face with someone, talking to them, helping them through is emotionally taxing and draining. How, how does, how do you deal with that and how have you dealt with it? Energy exchange for sure. I mean, I tell new therapists, sometimes they'll call about things or have questions, and I'll say, you know, you have to have decent boundaries, obviously. If, but if you don't love people, you can't help. Mm. And I remember being a little concerned about that. My mother had been a social worker before she got her PhD in sociology. She was actually in the first graduate faculty of the social work program here at BYU. Mm -hmm. She was recruited into that program because of her master's. And it was a great fit for her. I still meet students of hers at conferences that um, love um, what they learned from my mother. She's a genius in theory, but at any rate, um, I remember my mother and my husband were unofficial supervisors. Of course, I had to have an unrelated super supervisor to complete my licensure and so on. But I remember uh, my mother saying, uh, when she heard my concern about how much I cared about my clients, she said, well, it, we're social workers. We're allowed to love our clients. <laughs> and I was like, whew, because I really do. And you really can't help unless you do love. On the other hand, if you own their stuff, you can't help either because it's their life and they have to make their choices and you need to respect that. And I've had many clients who are so appreciative, they wanna give you all the credit, you know, you saved my life, you saved my marriage or whatever, and I'm like, no, it's what you did after the appointment that changed your life. And they need to know that. Mm. They are responsible for the choices they made and when they make good choices or learn new things or are willing to make change and growth happen in their lives, then they get the fruit. And I have the great privilege of being a facilitator and an instrument and a messenger, but I know who the healer is. Yeah. It's not me. Yeah. No, I've appreciated uh, you talk about, well, you have your podcast course called Choosing Glory. This is not about uh, becoming a winner in athletics or anything. It's about <laughs> choosing where you go. And President right. Nelson has recently talked to us. We kind of choose where we go. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell us a little bit more about that um, underlying theme and, and how that played a role in your life. So I was still a full-time mom. I was reading through the DNC, I, I just again, not for the first time. Loved the DNC. Love all, anyway, scriptures are amazing. 
but I was really struck this time through by section 88. I think it's verse 22 that starts talking this way about how he that is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory, etc., etc. And it really caught my attention. And I thought I'd read it before, but I, this time I thought, well, what exactly is celestial law? And how does it differ from terrestrial law or telestial law? And what law am I living? I'd, I'd like to think I'm living celestial law, but <laughs> can I be sure? And how would I distinguish that from the other laws of the other kingdoms? So I started thinking about it and looking for those, in, you know, intimations in the scripture. What, what are those laws? And I thought about this for years, and I started um, kind of keeping track of things that I, that I saw that would answer that question, and eventually started to write about it. And again, this was long before I went back to school, but I saw that you can distinguish between those laws, and that every day we are choosing the glory we're going to inhabit by the laws we obey. And God is kind. I mean, he doesn't put a chart anywhere, but the information is there. And especially if we are genuine seekers of God and we want what he offers and invites us to receive, then he will steer us to that information because he's generous. He's not looking for ways to keep us out. He's always looking for ways to bring us in. So it eventually became a book. Let's talk about the, the those concepts. God, I think, if we don't think about those things, we can go on and I think you know, especially when the book talks about those different levels, but you've also experienced uh, the roles of men and women and those kind of things. How does that all kind of come together as we're talking about, you know, uh, where we want to be and the roles that we play in our different lives, especially for men and women, and because they're under such attack in the world today? Now, we really are under attack. It's in, it's, uh, Satan is making his last stand as prophesied, right? And he's ruthless, and he's, he's not our friend, but... Uh, you know, God has all the answers. He, he has all the answers. And the more years I have done therapy, the clearer that has become. I didn't doubt it to begin with, but oh my goodness, it's manifest every day. Um, we try to reinvent the wheel. The, you know, the, the world tries to redefine things and come up with something that they think is going to be modern and new and exciting and, you know, different. And uh, frankly, none of it works. None of it works. So, is there adaptation that's required? Of course. Is this about limiting anybody? No, it's not about limiting anybody. But the kingdom of God and the highest level of the kingdom of God is men and women who have found this way to collaborate and become one. It's not in competition. It's in cooperation. It's not in trying to be the same. It's in acknowledging our strengths, each of our strengths, and the wide variety that there is of our talents and spiritual gifts that God is, again, abundantly generous with if we seek them. But I see so many people who are, you know, just barking up the wrong tree, you know, <laughs> that like, you know, somehow, oh, well, and then let me share this. I think that what really helped me when I was in high school wondering about motherhood was finally recognizing that I wasn't an exception. Mm. I might have had exceptional gifts in some area or another, but that didn't mean that I wasn't another daughter of God and that he didn't have a plan for his daughters and his sons. Now again, was adaptation gonna be involved? Absolutely, I didn't know I would end up being sent back to school. We adapted to that and God strengthened us and magnified our efforts because we were willing to obey. But it really comes back down to, if you'll forgive me, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but. I heard this when I was pretty young, and I feel like if there's a theme for my life, it would include this at least, Ezra Taft Benson's statement, that if we give our lives to God, he can make more of them than mm. we can. And I, I remember being very struck by that as a child, well, a young person at least, and I feel like that's what's happened, <laughs> that I've, I've said, okay, Lord, I'll pedal you steer. And I've been willing all along to let him steer. Now, sometimes I'd have a little spiritual tantrum about like, seriously, <laughs> I, don't, I didn't really want to do this. I didn't know it was going to include this particular sacrifice. But, but when it came right down to it, I was like, but okay, that's my deal with you. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I know that there will never be a better outcome than if I follow your path rather than try to create my own. So I, I see a lot of people struggling because they really are trying to wrestle it into their own path. And yet... His path is always better, and he doesn't waste anything. I hear, sadly, a lot of young women who feel like they will be less than somehow if they stay home. And <laughs> First of all, I don't think there's anything more soul-expanding in my entire life than to be a full-time mom. 
um, to, to try to meet the needs of those children and introduce them to their Heavenly Father and their Savior Jesus Christ and how to connect with them and teach them the principles of the gospel. My children grew up hearing me say the gospel is the best kept secret in the church. <laughs> but don't worry, I know where to find it. And you're going to hear it in your youth because it's in Scripture and there's power in there. And so to do that and to see them come to an understanding of true principles and to connect with God and feel His love and choose to obey, oh my goodness. I mean, you think God is just writing off his daughters, 50% of his children, and saying that like, okay, you guys are just gonna have to take it in the rear because you're gonna, somebody's gotta raise the kids? No, in the process of doing his will, we become more than we could ever have imagined. Mm -hmm. Like there's just no contest between our ways and his ways, and yet we keep, we keep in that tug of war too often, you know, just like, but, but I want it to be my way, and it's like, you know what? Trust. Trust the Lord. Trust him. Mm. He doesn't waste anything. You've got talents, you've got desires. You think that this is the only way that they can be fulfilled? Give it time. Grow in the way that you can now. He's gonna make more of you than you could possibly make of yourself. Hmm. You, know, you talked to you a little bit before, uh, the podcast wasn't necessarily something you wanted to keep doing. <laughs> Very time consuming. Right, we just have a couple of minutes left, I want to ask you. Uh, it seems like that's a common theme in, in your life is you know what, uh, it's not really what I want to do, but it's the thing I need to do. Yeah, and great blessings have come. Hey, they have come. Um, when my husband passed away, um, very unexpectedly, and it was um, tough, I've had such an outpouring of podcast listeners tell me how what the podcast has meant to them. I could never have had that opportunity in my little office, one client at a time. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I've had to share with a broader audience the principles of the gospel and the applications that are therapeutic, that are to help us in our marriages, with our children, with our own emotional well-being and spiritual well-being. It's, it's been a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. I, I want to thank you because when I contacted you to come and be on the show, then I didn't realize that your husband, this is recently your husband had just passed away. Mm -hmm. And as I was listening to you, uh, one of the things that really struck me is uh, when we have something that close to us that really as us reflect on our beliefs. And you believe that uh, in the gospel, in the plan. And so it makes it, it's not easier, but it makes it palatable, I guess. Is that right? And I suppose in a way that it does make it easier because I trust, I do trust that his ways are better, that he knows more, and that all, all that he does is motivated by his perfect love of us. And because, I, I mean, I was with my husband, it was early in the morning, we were out of town, and he called out my name, and I went and tried to help, and you know, called 911 and so on, but he was probably gone before they came. And I was trying to do CPR at the time, but I prayed just before I started CPR. If it's your will, I know you can heal him. But if it's not, help me accept it. And I think because I was willing to accept it, the Lord has been so generous in an outpouring of impressions and inspirations as to why the timing was what it was and what he can do with it, that timing, what he can do with me, what he will do for us as a couple and for our family as a family. He makes lemonade out of lemons. I've said often if the Lord had a business card, I think that's what it would say, <laughs> makes lemonade out of lemons. He always consecrates everything for our good if we let him. Rebellion gets in the way anger, bitterness, all those things get in the way. They don't have to. If we put them on the altar, he'll receive them and give us gold for lead, you know, beauty for ashes. That's his business. It's always better his way. Thank you so much for sharing, especially such a personal thing. I think it's in, inspiring. It helps uh, when we're struggling to see uh, your faith, and I really appreciate it. Uh, Lily Anderson, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk today. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.